are pleased to have with us veteran Hollywood industry figure and Rancho Mirage resident, James B. Harris, and he told me I can call him Jimmy, who has had an indelible impact on America's cinema, serving triple duty as a producer, director, and screenwriter. He partnered with legendary director Stanley Kubrick to produce several provocative classics, including The Killing, which we saw previously, that was our first screening, Paths of Glory and Lolita, before moving on to produce and direct The Bedford Incident, which will be our next film you'll be able to see, along with a number of other feature films, working with the likes of Cindy Poitier, Richard Pryor, James Woods, Wesley Snipes, and Dennis Hopper. To introduce today's film and guide us through the rest of the afternoon's program is Rancho Mirage own Stephen C. Smith. Stephen is not only one of our favorite presenters here at the library, he is also an award-winning producer, filmmaker, author, and historian. Following the film, Stephen will moderate a discussion and Q&A with Mr. Harris. Please join me in welcoming Stephen C. Smith and Jimmy Harris. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine, and thanks to the library staff that makes this not only so easy to do, but so fun to do. Well, I'm just curious, I can just see you enough, how many people were here last week for the killing? Okay, maybe 50%, so I'm glad we have more people today. Um, well, I'm only going to speak for about five minutes at most or so, but I did want to give just a little backstory on the film that you're going to see today. Uh, James B. Harris, who I think it's, I, I hope, Jimmy, you don't mind my revealing, 95 years young, will be talking with us, as Christine mentioned, after the film, so do stay for that and do think of some questions to ask him because he will no doubt have fascinating answers. But first, a recap of where his story ended uh, last week. Harris and his new partner in 1956, director Stanley Kubrick, made an extraordinary crime picture called The Killing for the low, low cost of $330,000, craft services money today. Uh, partly because they were unknowns, partly because the film was very unusual. It had an unusual, non-linear style of storytelling. Uh, unfortunately, The Killing was not a financial success, but it did get several positive reviews. And the boldness of its storytelling style, the striking visuals, caught the attention of some important people in Hollywood. Most importantly, this one, who I'm sure you will recognize, Kirk Douglas. In 1956, Kirk Douglas was one of the biggest box office stars in the world. He had just played Vincent Van Gogh in the biopic Lust for Life, and he wasn't afraid to take chances balancing commercial films with more edgy ones. And Kirk Douglas was interested in working with James B. Harris and Stanley Kubrick, and the result is the movie that you are about to see, Paths of Glory. It's based on a novel of the same name by Humphrey Cobb, a novel based on a true historical incident in World War I. And I don't want to give away the story, so I will just say that it shows very powerfully the injustices that can occur amid the fog of war. Like The Killing, it focuses on a small but compelling group of characters, a colonel in the French army, played by Kirk Douglas, and three soldiers who, through no fault of their own, become pawns in a political battle that could cost them their lives. Now, both James B. Harris and Stanley Kubrick were all of, get ready for this, 29 when they made this movie. I'm right, Jimmy, yes? 29 years old and working with Kirk Douglas, who was both the star and also a co-producer on this. And Kirk was not the easiest person to, to work with. You'll hear that from many people. I mean, many good qualities, but sometimes a challenge, and Jimmy will tell us more about that. But with James B. Harris's help at every step, Stanley Kubrick approached directing the film and directing Kirk Douglas with great confidence. Early in Paths of Glory, you will see some harrowing battle scenes, and here you see the trenches built for the film, which gave Kubrick a chance to create some unforgettable camera shots. Throughout his career, Kubrick was fascinated by the subject of war, as we see in later films of his, like Dr. Strangelove in Full Metal Jacket, as, uh, as, and it's a subject also of interest to 
Jimmy, as we will see in the film also next week. And Kubrick's fascination with the toll that war can take on men and the political stratagems played out by those in charge, that really starts for both men in Paths of Glory. Now this was a very tight shoot and a cold one, as you can see from the way that Stanley Kubrick is bundled up in the photo at left. And remarkably, even though the movie feels very large in scope, it is less than an hour and a half long. Its power, I think, is due to the story, the performances, the direction, and the quality of its production. It was shot in Bavaria, Germany, and the majority of the scenes were filmed here at the Schleisheim Palace near Munich. And the way that Harrison Kubrick used this location is, I think, extraordinary. With its tiled floor, it's almost as if the location is a giant chessboard on which a very dangerous game is being played. There was a great deal of rewriting done on the film, uh, not least of which involved the ending, and Jimmy will tell us more about that after the movie. Paths of Glory opened on December 20th, 1957, and even with Kirk Douglas starring, this was a challenging story for a general audience, and the film, which cost about a million dollars, was not a great financial success. It also angered French military authorities so much that the movie was banned in France until 1975. But Paths of Glory did receive many rave reviews, and over the next seven decades, it's developed a deserved reputation as a classic. Jimmy will tell us much more about the making of the film after we see it, but I'll leave you with something to watch for. Paths of Glory has an unusual and memorable final scene, and it features this woman. Who is she? Well, we will find out after the movie. Here from director Stanley Kubrick and producer James B. Harris is the film that Kirk Douglas once called the summit of my career, Paths of Glory. Thank you very much. By the way, a thank you to uh, Jimmy, to your wonderful staff that provided the images that we saw earlier. Thank you, Susan, for those. Well, uh, it's, it's difficult <laughs> to add words when that ending is so eloquent without words, but I have to say that uh, that film sadly uh, does not go out of uh, style in any way. It, it seems as, as relevant as ever, and it's a, it's a powerful, moving film, and much like the one we watched last week, The Killing. I always hope that it's going to end differently, but, uh, and, and we'll get to that ending in a moment. But first, I had raised a question. Who, who is the actress that we see at the end of the film? And Jimmy, who was that? Uh, that's uh, uh, Suzanne Christian. Her name was at that time. But her name now is, is, is uh, Christiana Kubrick. Mrs. Stanley Kubrick, yes. They married after this film and remained together for 40 plus years, and yeah. she's happily still with us. Yeah, well, <clears throat> there's a story with that that I, I thought that uh, I have to remember how, how Stanley uh, presented the idea to me. Uh, that ending was not in the script originally, and uh, when we got over to Germany and we're preparing to get started on the film, Stanley said to me he had an idea for an ending of the picture that was not in the script. And he explained to me uh, what, what you saw on the screen, that the German girl should be presented to these troops as, and, and have to sing a song in, in order to entertain them. Uh, I, I said, and, and uh, who's, gonna, who's gonna sing the song? And he said, well, I met this girl. And, and I said, oh boy, you know. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe Stanley would do a thing like that, you know, because he's so dedicated, such a such a dedicated filmmaker that he'd never, never offer, you know, use the film, you know, to, to hit on a girl. <laughs> but uh, so I said, Stanley, you you, you got to be kidding with this. I mean, the script is fine as it is; it doesn't need an ending like that. Uh, you can see how how smart I was at that time. I just. It's one of the best endings that you could possibly put on this on this film. 
but uh, but, but being part in this, and, and you know, he always took seriously what, what I suggest. He said, "Listen, let's shoot the, the the scene, and if you don't like it, we won't use it." Uh, well, it wound up that I was I was conducting the singing at, at, of, of, of all those troops at the end. Uh, he really sold me on it, and, and rightly so. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the, I think the best thing that ever happened to Stanley was to have met Christiana. Uh, because she she really uh, straightened him out. <laughs> <laughs> she gave him a stable home life that let his imagination run wild. Well, I will just modify that slightly, Jimmy, and say that was the best personal thing to happen to him. And professionally, uh, as we saw last week, the best thing was connecting with someone who knew how to find money, find good screen properties, and, and together make excellent films. Um, looking at the ending of this film, I mentioned that it was uh, it was based on a novel that in itself was based on a true incident. Uh, it is obviously not the most commercial of endings to choose. It is it is a a very poignant one, a tragic one. And tell me about the process because this was not a, the the way the film ends with the execution was not always the way it was going to end. Can you tell us in a I know we don't have time for the whole story, but tell us a little about the back and forth and, and Kirk Douglas's role in that. Uh, well, it's it's uh, it is a long story actually, but uh, I'll try to cut it as short as I can. Uh, the script originally uh, had a had a uh, ending where the men were were saved in the last last minute. Uh, trying to remember how we did that, I suppose the the fact that that it was discovered that the, the general ordered uh, artillery to fire on his own men, and, and that uh, became. Uh, the way the men were saved by, the, by the revealing that and uh, the general had to take the, the, the blame for that. So the men were saved. Uh, United Artists, of course, w would, would be uh, uh, m much more uh, happy with a, with a happy ending uh, because it's more commercial and it leaves people with a, with a uplifting feeling when they leave the theater. Uh, so, uh, Stanley and, and, and Calder Willingham, the writer, one of the writers, went ahead to Germany, and Kirk and I stayed back, and, 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 uh, and they, they started to, to play with the script now. Stanley must have felt, I, I know he did, that, that there was something wrong with the ending of the picture, that to tell this kind of a story and, and to try to make the point of these terrible things that happen in, in, in war, you must execute the men, because it, it just doesn't make... I mean, the book was was that way, uh, but you know, com studios like to to have uh, happy endings because it's more commercial. But Stanley evidently uh, figured that that, there, that he had to had to find some way to make the 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 ending of the picture more more interesting, uh, and and devise some kind of a plan that that. The men were still saved, but it was a whole other rigmarole. But anyway, when Kirk and I got to Germany and Stanley showed me the script, uh, I, I, I said, you know, th this is terrible. I mean, it just, it just, it's just awful. Uh, what, what's Kirk going to say when he sees this? Because, you know, this is not the script he agreed to do. Uh, anyway. Uh, I was right about that. Kirk was was absolutely uh, uh, you know, totally disturbed by it. He, he wouldn't do it, and he threatened to go home. That, that if we wanted to shoot the, this new ending that that Kubrick and Willingham had come up with, uh, you know, he, he didn't he wouldn't want to be a part of it. Uh, we realized that that we couldn't let let Kirk go home. I mean, that and leave the picture. He wasn't just going home. He was quitting the film. Yeah. Uh, you know, when 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 a studio finances a film, in those days, they gave you the the, the money in increments, and and they make you sign a note for it, because if anything should happen and, and you don't perform and do what the what the deal is, you have to pay that money back. Now, if Kirk goes home, uh, there's hundreds of thousands already spent on, on the movie up to this point, of which I've signed notes for that, that it's my responsibility to pay that money back. So you can understand that, that there's no way that, that, that we can let uh, Kirk leave because that we couldn't possibly replace him. 
So uh, we decided that, that uh, the, only, uh, the only thing to do was, was to have them been executed in the end. And when we told to Kurt that that, that was what we had decided, he, he, he immediately fell in love with the, with, the, with the script now because everybody knew that, that this was the honest way to tell the story. But I, I had one problem, is that United Artists didn't know what we were doing. They thought it was going to have a happy ending. Yeah. Small problem. And now here's, here's where, where, where producing you know, becomes almost as important as directing. Pay attention, anyone who wants to be a producer. This uh, is good. I figured that, that I cannot send the, the, uh, the, the, the new changes back to United Artists because I, I, I'm obliged to do that. Uh, so I figured the way to do that is to send them the whole script with the new ending. Because knowing how, how, how busy all these executives are, they'd never read the script. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm off the hook because I have sent the, the, the new ending to them. It just happens that it's, it's, it's on page 124 or something. And, <laughs> then, and, and, but through the whole making of this movie, I had to worry about what's the day of reckoning is going to come when, when UA sees this movie. And, and finally, we delivered the picture. Sees the ending where they're killed. And they screen the movie and uh, nothing. You know, it's just another picture. You know, they admitted it wasn't for Christmas. You know. <laughs> but, but I was so glad to get out of that office and, and, and get away. And, and, and you know, it, it's so true that the, these guys are so busy. And a picture like this is really, compared to so many, you know, the 50 movies that they make that year, it's just another movie. So uh, that's the end of that story. But, the, but it's also the end of the movie. And it, 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 it turned out pretty good. Yes, and uh, I'm sure they felt that as long as Kirk Douglas was happy, which he was mm -hmm. uh, very happy, then they would be happy. And speaking of Kirk, you had just made one real professional film before this, The Killing, and that was made up, uh, the cast consisted of terrific actors, but really character actors. Even Sterling Hayden was a, you know, not a big, big movie star. Now you're working with one of the biggest movie stars on the planet, Kirk Douglas, and his production company is, is the name we see at the beginning of the film. So what was it like working with him? Uh, well, you, you have to realize that, 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 that Kirk being attached to this movie made it all possible because you can't raise the money to make the movie uh, in those cases without a major star. Uh, and so, uh, but the thing is that Kirk, let you know it. I mean, we had only done one film together, Stanley and I. We were only 29 years old. Kirk was 40 at the time. He, he, he did multiple films. He was a major movie star. And uh, uh, he, 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 but he, he's, he, he's, he's a dedicated artist as well. And, and he did appreciate that, that we were there trying to make the best film possible. Uh, that we're dealing with basically a new director. Uh, and uh, the proof of that, I mean, he was so impressed with Stanley that he eventually got, we, we made a deal for Stanley to direct Spartacus, which, which was Kirk's movie. One thing I want to straighten out though, that, that in order to get Kirk in the movie, uh, we had to negotiate a, a deal that, that was really unfair. I mean, Kirk had an agent that was a killer. And, <laughs> And, and we had to sign a deal to, to, to work for his company, which was called Bryna. Uh, we had to make five more movies with, with him. Now, Kirk was, was, was strictly an employee on this movie. He did not co-produce it. He, did not, he had nothing to do with, the, with the, the production of this movie. Part of the deal was we had to give his company a credit. And, and you noticed when the picture opened, it said, you know, Bryna Productions. Uh, so, uh, I've had to live with that, you know. So how did you get out of having to make those five movies with him? Uh, it's, it's, it's too long a story. To, 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 <laughs> well, maybe a, a short version is that Stanley did go on to direct Spartacus, which Kirk Douglas starred in, and uh, they didn't exactly get along wonderfully on that one, and uh, 
that probably contributed to it. But that film turned out to be an enormous success. And meantime, you were developing the next Harris Kubrick film, Lolita, which proved to be your first Oscar-nominated hit and uh, got a lot of attention. And so really, many good things came out of the making of Paths of Glory, even though, like The Killing, it was not fully appreciated in its time. I will just say, does it, is anyone out there a fan of the HBO series The Wire that was on a few years ago? The wonderful, yes. The, the creator and producer of it, David Simon, said that in creating that series, he studied Paths of Glory because he thought it was such a brilliant film about structure and the interaction of different levels, strata of organization and management and what can go wrong. And uh, so your film has had a tremendous influence on filmmakers for you know, over six decades now. How, how does that feel? Well, it feels great. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you know, when you make a movie uh, and, you're, uh, and you have a, a screenplay that you're working with, you have a tight schedule, you have a tight budget, uh, a lot of things can go wrong. This, this picture you know, could, have been, could, uh, could have been a disaster, really. If, if, if we didn't kill the man, you know, the picture would really be about nothing. You know, it'd be have, it would have like a, a saccharine sweet ending and, and uh, you know, it'd be like a Hollywood movie. Uh, the thing about, about this movie that, that people really, you don't know, is, uh, is that uh, I had a, a had problem with, with one of the actors in the movie. He's, he's, he's really terrific on the screen. And, and his name is Timothy Carey. Uh, and you'll notice he was the one that, that, that was executed in the end and he's crying and, and doing all of that. You may remember him also from The Killing as the shooter of the horse, uh, and uh, yes. No, no, Tim is, is, a, is a scene stealer. You know, he, 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 he has to be really controlled, you know, but, but uh, and he, uh, he staged a, a fake kidnapping of himself. Uh, at, at, I got a call at six o'clock in the morning from the police saying that they found an actor from our film that was, it was tied up in, 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 a, in, a, in a street somewhere, and he claimed he had been kidnapped. Somewhere in Germany, oh, while yeah. you're making this. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I know that, that, that we didn't stage it as a publicity stunt, that, that Tim had done this himself to try to get publicity for himself. And, uh, and, but we have a shooting schedule, and, and Tim is needed. And um, we're at the police station, and, and the studio is 45 minutes away, and everybody's waiting. Uh, so the police allowed us to, to let Tim go back to the to the uh, sh to the studio, but he had to sign a, uh, a, a report actually, and 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 he started to to uh, dictate all kinds of changes in the report, and he wouldn't sign it, and everybody's waiting. And you, you can't let people like Adolf Manjou and George McCready and Kirk and, and those, you know, stand around waiting for, for, for this guy. Uh, and I told Tim that, that if he doesn't sign this thing and, and get through with it and get back to work, um, I'm going to have to fire him. And uh, he's a key player in the film, obviously. He's one of the three men. Okay. Well, the, the, he, 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 he stepped kept uh, stalling and stalling, and finally I, ha I, had to, I had to fire him. I told Stanley there's no other way because the, the, he, he, it could be very destructive to the rest of the cast, and, you know. Uh, okay, now, when you, when you shoot a picture, you're shooting uh, at, a, you know, at a sequence. Uh, we hadn't shot the, the, the battle scene yet. The battle scene is the last thing that we shot in the movie. You'll notice that we did not have any of the three actors that were executed in the battle scene. <laughs> That's because Tim Carey <laughs> was, wasn't around anymore. <laughs> he was also doubled in, in some of those scenes. In the, in the, we, 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 you know, so we shot him from the back. That when at the end, when they're waiting to be executed. Yeah, that's a double that we, we've used. And incidentally, even Christiana, who sang the song in the end, we only had her for one day because she was a busy actress at that time. And so, so any shots that were from behind her, we used a, a double for that too. Uh, a lot of tricks in making movies, you know, that, that, that 
you, you, you don't want people to know about because they, you know, it's sort of a magical thing, but it's, it's, yeah. such, it's such a phony thing when, you <laughs> when you're making movies to figure your way out of all this trouble. Yeah. Well, that was a very bold move, and it sort of has a, it's, I, I can't help but think of a parallel with the film where you're in this tricky situation of what you have to do with uh, Timothy Carey. Now, that said, he was an actor who is very distinctive, memorable. He, there's a, a Tim Carey following all these decades later, and for good reason. He's, he, you can't help but watch him. And, Jimmy, you hired him again later on another movie. What happened? Why, number one, and two, what happened? Well, you know, the, you, you have your own ego. You think you, I'm, I'm directing at this point. I've directed several films since then, and I figured, well, I can deal with him. We're now in the 1980s, and the yeah. film is fast walking. So I figure it's 20 years later or so. Uh, give him a break, and, and, you know, all is forgiven, and, and he's a good guy. So we're on location in, in Montana, and uh, Tim is a, is, it's a prison picture, and, 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 and Tim has been thrown off the fourth tier and, and, and has died in the crash on the floor. And we're shooting that first. So that's the first thing we're gonna be shooting with Tim Carey. He's lying dead on the floor. And being the scene stealer that he is, he's doing shtick, you know, on, on the floor. He's, is his foot kicking? Or? He's twitching and he's, he's doing all kinds of stuff that, and I said, Tim, you're dead. You, you, you can't be moving, you, you know. I said, if we're gonna have trouble with you again, I'm going back 20 years now. You know, we haven't shot anything yet on you, so we can replace you with no trouble at all. <laughs> but, you know, if, 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 if we had shot lots of scenes with him, just think how you'd have to deal with him because you couldn't reshoot all that stuff if you fired him. Uh, so you killed him first, that was very smart. We, we were, yeah, that's true. We were lucky on Paths of Glory that we had shot most of the stuff with Tim. Yeah, you know, the, know the court martial scenes and, and all the trend stuff. Incidentally, uh, Stanley's use of the camera was, you know, I'm watching this picture again, you know, and every time I see it, I notice new things that, that I never noticed. Making him uh, even more talented <laughs> than I remembered. Uh, the trenches, you know, we tried to do everything as, as, as real as possible, but Stanley wanted to, to do a lot of dolly shots through the trenches, but the camera and the dolly wouldn't fit through a trench if you built it exactly the way it was. So we had to, to, to you know, to take advantage, you know, and, and widen the trenches so that we could fit the dolly and the camera through that. Uh, but nobody knows the difference. No. Uh, and those are some of the most iconic shots of the film and I think really foreshadow something we'll see in a lot of Kubrick films, a kind of sense of symmetry and camera movement and uh, it's, it's so powerful even before the battle begins. You know, watching that, that, the battle scene, uh, you know, Kirk had to, to, to go through that thing. You know, you think, just, just think what take two is like, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> How many takes, I mean, did you do on most of those action shots? Well, uh, you know, Stanley likes to do lots of takes to make sure he's so got I everything heard. that he wants. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but in those days, we had a schedule and a budget, so you couldn't, you couldn't do all of that. But, but, but after Kirk had run through that whole thing, you know, we said, well, well let's, let's go again. And he said, oh, this is it. You know, I'm only going to do it once more. And, and so that's when the big star tells you, and, and there's nothing you can do about it, because he, he just was not going to do it more than twice. And, you know, Maybe if, if 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 it was a Kubrick of today, or or when Kubrick became a, an icon, right in the eighties and nineties, yeah, the, the actors would do it multiple times because it's Kubrick. But in those days, we were just two kids that, that uh, you're lucky to have Kirk in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyway, uh, the, the the oh, another thing is is that. It's freezing cold out there, uh, you know. You notice some of the stills that they had there were bundled up. And, and the night of the patrol, uh, there was, there, I just, I just wanna say that, that, you know, people think of Stanley, you know, as this kind of, of uh, you know, genius that, that, you know, is so dedicated to film that he would never do anything that, that is, is uh, that, 
that gets away from, from his dedication. But there were certain things in that patrol scene, you know, where Wayne Morris throws the grenade and kills. Kills one of his, his own men, yes. Uh, we were, we were uh, shooting it at night, because that was a night shot, a night scene. And, and it was freezing cold. We're drinking tea with the rum in, in this chair to keep warm. And we started to look at some of the stuff that still had to be done in the, in the patrol scene. And Stanley, <laughs> and Stanley said, uh, you know, it's pretty cold out there. <laughs> and we started tearing the pages out. <laughs> well, you tore the right pages out because this movie has such a sense of forward momentum. And, you know, given that it's partly a courtroom movie, those are great, but they can get talky. And this movie, for me, just moves along to the end. It has a great uh, narrative momentum, which I think is true of all the movies you've done, Jimmy, both with Kubrick and on your own. Yeah, it, it, uh, I miss Stanley a lot. Uh, we, we were more than just partners. I mean, we were buddies and, and we hung out together. Uh, but I had a desire. When you hang around a guy like that, he, he, you know, I started as a producer. But, you know, when you watch him and you think, gee, that's pretty easy. I think I could do that. <laughs> you know, <so laughs> yeah, it, it, it turns out it's not that easy. But uh, I... Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, I was going to say that's a perfect segue to say, please come back on Monday. Don't leave yet. We have the Q&A. But do come back on Monday because you will see Jimmy's first film as a director, The Bedford Incident, with, oh, let's see, Richard Widmark, Sidney Poitier, Martin Balsam, Donald Sutherland, great cast, uh, a, a really powerful film. And we'll see what uh, Jimmy learns sitting uh, next and moving and walking around briskly <laughs> with Stanley on these films. But may I suggest, Jimmy, that we open it up to some questions? And Absolutely, You, can, you yeah. can continue to share your memories as we go along. But I'm, I'm just going to guess that there might be some questions out there. So would you please raise your hands? Christine, yes. You said that? I'll repeat it. Christine's asking about the use of uh, Kirk, the Kirk Douglas character, Dax, when he's blowing the whistle. Are you, do you mean, Christine, in, in France in 1916? Was that uh, historically yeah, done? Well, well, I wasn't there in 1916. <laughs> Missed so it by that much. I don't know too much about the whistle. You know, forget the whistle. I mean, that's... that's uh, <laughs> It certainly is a dramatic thing to kind of keep your focus on where he is and is kind of a rallying cry, right? Actually, actually I found it kind of annoying listening to it <laughs> just now when we're watching the film. I wish we had, you know, not used it so much. But uh, the, the um, what, what was I going to say? <laughs> you know, when you get this age, you can't even remember what, what, what certain things. I, I can remember more about the picture then I can about the questions right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we can we say that uh, I, I know why you I can guess why you singled that out because it's such a shrill kind of striking oh. moment. And I, I'm going to guess as no military historian that it would make sense in a battle that the highest frequency, if you're mm -hmm. trying to you know reach your men, it would make sense that a whistle would be used. And it, as a dr dramatic device, purely on a film soundtrack to be heard amid all the mortar shells and yelling and all of that, it, it is uh, mm -hmm. it's a it's an effective choice. I know what I just remembered what I wanted to say. I was just vamping <laughs> for you. I don't know what you people think about when you're dealing with a story that takes place in a foreign country with all the the characters in the piece are foreign, are French. And we cast the movie with all Americans. And, and I don't know how, whether you even thought about it when you're watching the film, but we, was, we, we chose to have them speak with Americanese, you know, with their, with, as they speak normally. Now, Bosley Crowther, who was the, the king of the, uh, the critics. New York Times critic, who best known today for giving the absolute opposite reviews uh, of how films are regarded today. In other words, if he hated it, it's now widely thought of as a classic. If he loved it, we've forgotten it for a good reason. But yes, Bosley Crowther. Bosley Crowther uh, did not give this a good review because he couldn't get with this idea of, of, of all of these French characters speaking American ease, you know, 
So what he probably was suggesting is that if we were casting it, they would be speaking with accents. Yeah, having Kirk Douglas do a French accent I mean, it was for the ridiculous. whole movie. Yeah, that's a great idea, Bosley Crowther. I, and he apparently had never seen the 1930 Best Picture winner, All Quiet on the Western Front, which is about German soldiers played by Americans. And I don't. For me, it gives it a universality. Is that yes, we're reminded that this is happening in but, France. But some of the but best, greatest pictures ever made were, were done that way. Dr. Shabako, for instance, they're all Russians. There are no. English speaking people in the cast, I mean, in the characters, and yet they're all speaking the way they speak. Right. You know, Geraldine Chaplin and, and you know, uh, Rod Steiger is yeah. in it. I uh, think as long as there's consistency. I yeah. mean, look at all the biblical epics, you know, who knows what people's yeah. accents were like Ad then. Adrian Brody, Brody won the Academy Award for the pianist. Right, playing a Polish pianist. Yeah. Uh, uh, What's uh, Spielberg's movie? The, the Schindler's List. Schindler's yes. List. Yeah. Uh, so, th as I think, consistency is the key. If you had, say, Adolf Maju, who was in the cast, <laughs> who had been in films since the 1920s, um, if he had been speaking with a French accent and no one else had, that would have been very strange. I think. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I was just wondering whether whether uh, anybody in the audience really uh, thought well, about. Well, we have that. a we have a question or an answer right here. I'll repeat that briefly. Uh, how long did it take to do the blocking of shots, like the, the battle scenes, and even something as seemingly simple as the opening shot of the arrival to the uh, chateau? And, and I know you know there are many, many shots that require different time. But on average, let's say one of those shots of the men crawling over the hill with explosions. How much prep time was there versus the filming? Well, you don't. Re we didn't have any rehearsals for, for the battle scene. I mean, you just. We, we recruited f from the uh, German uh, National Guard or something, all of those guys, and, and uh, you just outline exactly what they're going to do, get out of the trenches. And, and right. we, had, we had taken a farm and built the battlefield. It was the last thing we shot in the movie. And, and uh, that's why the, the three guys weren't in the right. scene. We're not in it because Timothy McCary wouldn't sign yeah. a piece of paper saying he made up his yeah. kidnapping. Anyway, the, 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 uh, there wasn't much time for rehearsals. We shot the picture in 66 days. And, and uh, uh, I don't remember t too much rehearsals. For yeah. it. You know, the, 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 these are all trained actors. Yeah. All the, the, the Clearly except, except a couple of them were, were uh, we, we found over there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Captain that was in charge of the artillery, he was a local, uh, you know, uh, U.S. Army. Mm -hmm. We found him. We had to find people who spoke English, right. and he, I could tell that he, he sounded like an amateur to me. So? Or sounded like a real person, if you could. Have Sound, yeah, well, it, yeah. you know, yeah. sounded like thank an amateur. Thank you. Thanks for coming back. We've got one in the back here. Yes, uh, back here. So the explosions during the battle scenes were those in real time? I'm sure there weren't a lot of special effects in the movie. No, the explosions real, real time. done in right. real time. Yeah. So there must have been rehearsal of that. For, you know, there for was no CGI in those days. There was no <laughs> so I've heard, yes. Yeah, and, and, uh, how, how do you do that, though, when you're on a tight schedule to ensure that it all goes well and there are those explosions going off around the men? Is it because sometimes you can, we can use the camera to sort of have them farther away, the, the explosions be farther away from the men, and you can use certain lenses to make them seem closer. How did you, how did you do that on a tight schedule with very little time? Uh, gee, I, don't, I, I can't remember. <laughs> 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 we did it. Uh, you know, you have, you have professionals yes. that, that help you do this. Yeah. You, making movies is a collaborative effort. I mean, you know, this auteur business is really exaggerated. Yeah. You, everybody needs help. You, you know, that's, you, you pay them and, and you expect them to, 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 you know, the cameraman has ideas. Yeah. They're all, they, they're all yeah. helpful. You have special effects people yes. who know how to plant those explosions. You, st it, you know, right. you, they're marked so you, so the actors, or the or the stunt people stay away from them. And, and uh, yeah, when you when you're having anything that's dangerous, you use stunt people who are professionals, right. 
uh, you, you don't subject regular actors to, to those things. No. no. So budget for special effects not done live on the set, zero. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. And I believe there's a question here in the front. Yes. Was there a Stanley Kubrick cameo no. in the film? I was out in the battlefield with an IMO camera mm. shooting some of the shots. Really? You yeah. were shooting some of the shots? Because yeah. tell us a little about your time in the Army and what you learned about shooting then. Well, as I said last week, I, did a, I was in the Korean War, and, and I did a lot of fighting in the Korean War. I was really fought as hard as anybody could fight, but they took me anyway. <laughs> but, and they liked you enough to have you photograph the atomic bomb. Yeah, yes. but seriously, folks. Uh, 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 but you really did pho photograph an atomic. So you had you had military experience. Yeah. Did that influence the way you made this film? Which film? Paths of Glory. <laughs> You're not going to get out of talking about this movie. No, no, no. It had, it had no experience. Yeah. No. And it's interesting that Kubrick, who didn't have war service, was sort of obsessed with it. He wanted to make a film about Napoleon, who was the subject of an upcoming Ridley Scott film. And uh, of course, he made several war-related films after that. Yeah, you know, I'm, the next picture we're going to see next Monday is the Bedford incident, which which takes place on a destroyer. Well, I was in the army, not the navy. I didn't know the first thing about the, the navy or, or the ships. But you get technical advisors. Right. You uh, you learn, you yeah. know, and, and uh, nobody knows the difference. Right. Right. Well, we'll be talking about that one next week. Yes, sir. Yes, the gentleman was referencing another real-life incident that brought a great deal of discredit to France uh, in the late 19th century, the Dreyfus Affair, when a Jewish officer was uh, prosecuted and, and jailed I I for something he didn't do, and the novelist Emile Zola was among those who championed the Dreyfus Affair, as it was known, and, his exo and the exoneration, eventually, of Dreyfus. And uh, there's a good film of that, uh, The Life of Emile Zola, and uh, much of that film is about Zola's campaign uh, to exonerate Dreyfus, which uh, was a long protracted thing, but did happen. And yes, that happened, and then a generation or so later came this incident in 1916. So uh, when the French saw this film in 1957 uh, with, with de Gaulle uh, in, in power, they were not amused. They <laughs> would have none of it. And uh, Jimmy, you were telling me that it was not until uh, de Gaulle's passing that this film was finally allowed to be shown, as pe and people really wanted to see it in France in 1975. Yeah, the, the picture was banned in, in France and Spain, because in Spain you, you had Franco, and in, in France you had de Gaulle. And in, until those were no longer in office, the picture was banned. But once they, were, uh, they had a different administration, uh, they opened up the, the uh, they were a little bit more tolerant about criticism of the military. Yes. Any last questions? Yes, sir. Right. Right, right. Were the sounds of the explosions dubbed in later, Jimmy? They are on a film, oh, sure. aren't they? Yes, ex yes, they were. Yeah, it's the same with dancing. When you look at people dancing in a film, uh, I used to you know, go on a lot of sets and shoot behind the scenes footage as a producer, still do sometimes, but it's fun to watch them do a scene that involves people dancing to music or all of that because there's no music playing. There's something establishing a beat, but in order to have the dialogue play so that you know, in that waltzing scene, they can walk over to Adolf Manjou and say, you're needed, and he goes out, uh, everyone is just do waltzing silently. It's a little strange to see. And uh, same with uh, with battle scenes that when, you know, to record the dialogue cleanly, even though you're probably going to loop a lot of it later post-record it, yeah, you, you don't have sounds like that on the set. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir, in the back.
yes, the gentleman was saying that when he saw it as a young man, there he wanted more action from it, and then but he's seen it twice since and realizes what a terrific anti-war film you made. Yeah, well, uh, you know, when Stanley w was was uh, we made a deal for Stanley to direct Spartacus. Yes, and and when he when when he read the the script, there was no there was no battle scene, mm -hmm. and to make his point that, that there was no. Yeah. He knew that they needed a battle scene in yeah. a three-hour movie called Spartacus, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, why was the director fired before Kubrick? No, it, it actually was a very fine director who just didn't get along with Mr. Douglas. <laughs> so yes, Stanley came in, and but yeah, he knew the need for that. So, so both that film and this one, I think, have a balance of action and you know dramatic scenes. And you know, sometimes Kubrick has a reputation for being a quote unquote cold filmmaker, but I think this film disproves that. And the Stanley you knew was not a cold person, was he? I mean, not he, at all. Yeah, no. not at all. But uh, I, it was it was just the most terrific experience to to uh, have been his, his his friend, his his partner, and uh, uh, his uh, I guess partner on, ma on making yeah. the films that we did. Uh, he, I mean, what a luxury it was to, to have be associated with him uh, with nothing else, learning how to make films. Well, and it was a two-way street because you were the one who found the property that allowed him to make, you know, make the killing and then led immediately to this film. So it was a great partnership. And next week, again, I encourage you to come on Monday to see uh, the very impressive work that James B. Harris did after being with Stanley Kubrick for those years uh, and uh, creating a very fine thriller on his own, The Bedford Incident. Yeah, so, w w One last thing yes. I'd like to say is that not enough credit really is given to, to the authors of the previously published material that, that our movies are based on. Both Stanley and myself, whether we did it together or on our own, we never did a film that wasn't based on somebody else's material. You know, right. being a book or a play or a magazine or a, uh, I did a picture once with, with, with just a 16 page uh, short story by James Calder. Right. But it was still his story. You realize that, that the, the author has made up the story. I mean, the very story that, 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 that we see, that we think, gee, what a great story. Somebody else made that. We didn't make that up. What we did was we acquired the rights to that story. Yes. He did all the, the heavy lifting. He's the author of, of, of the book. He, he built the characters. He told the story. He did all the research that, that, that whatever it was about. Uh, so when we, when we acquire the film rights, we're, we're inheriting all of his work, and all we have to do is adapt it. Right. <laughs> it's not that easy, though, no, because no. you have to choose what to dramatize and what not to, yes. and what to leave out and, and, yes. and what to improve that doesn't lend itself to, to, to the film. But, but I'd just like to, 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 every time I'm interviewed uh, or I see other, they never give credit to the, to the authors of, of the material. Right. Well, I can't think of a better note to end on in a library than that one. So, <laughs> right? Thank you, Jimmy. So, thank you, James B. Harris. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, TJ, Stephen, and Aaron here at the library. And please come back Monday. And thanks so much. Okay.